Okay, we are live. Um, we're gonna start in about a minute, um, but we just want to um, gather everybody together for a sec um, before we start the program. I'm gonna send a link to the slides that we're about to go through in the chat, um, in the comments. So hopefully everybody can see that. Um, and if you are tuning in after the fact, we're gonna start very soon, like 30 seconds. We are just waiting for people to jump on. Um, and I'll introduce us in just a second. Almost noon. I can't believe it's already noon, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I haven't done anything yet today. OK, um, we could introduce ourselves and start. Um, my name is Rachel Mead. I am the Public Engagement and Interpretation Coordinator at the Leventhal Map Center. Um, sorry if my internet is kind of bad. Um, hopefully you can still see me. Um, and this is Dennis McCarthy, who is a volunteer at the Map Center. Um, Dennis, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Uh, okay, I'm, uh, I'm retired and I do a number of uh, volunteer activities in what's called public history. The Leventhal is one. I'm also a uh, Art and Architecture Tour Guide at the BPL when that's open, and a uh, guide for Boston by foot. Yeah. So uh, very well-versed in Boston history, um, which is perfect for today. And um, we could mm -hmm. get started with um, Boston by map. Okay, you wanna put my, there we yeah. go. And I'll go over there, oops, sorry. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> basically today's session is divided into two parts. In the first part, Rachel and I will be presenting some material, including an example to sort of motivate how to tell sto uh, stories about Boston using historic maps and atlases. And in the second part, it's, uh, it'll be discussion. You know, your questions, your comments, uh, Tell us about your project. You know, we, we can give you some pointers on getting started. So <clears throat> today we're going to start with an example, and it's uh, what was called the Charles River Bay and later the Prison Point Bay. Uh, everybody knows about the Back Bay, of course. Uh, this is another bay out off the Charles River, um, quite large, that's pretty much completely forgotten. Uh, the two aspects we're going to talk about it are the land making, how it got filled, and its role as a north-south transportation corridor for over two centuries now. In fact, uh, the sequence of transportation technologies that you saw crossing the Prison Point Bay over those two centuries reflects the history, uh, history of transportation in the United States. So first of all, where is this bay we're talking about? So I'm gonna start with an historic map. This is from 1775. Uh, here is Boston. It's on the, the town of Boston is on the Shawmut Peninsula here. The Shawmut Peninsula is connected to the mainland by a narrow strip of land called the Neck. Uh, to the left of the Neck is the Back Bay, which was later filled. And to the right of the Neck was the South Bay, which is later, later filled. But we're going to put our attention up here to the north. Let me zoom in on this. To the bay that used to separate Charlestown from uh, Cambridge. So here's the Charlestown Peninsula. It has its own little neck here, much squatter than the Shawmut Peninsula one. Uh, and then here is Cambridge over here. <clears throat> and what you've got is uh, at the top of the bay here, there's a, a labeled Mill Pond is a piece of the bay that was dammed off in the 1600s to form a, a mill pond or power, tide powered uh, mills. Uh, on the other side, there's this large stream flowing out of Cambridge into this bay. And then below those, uh, you've got two points sticking out at each other, making a narrow part. You can see there's sort of two shorelines on this map. This is a high tide shoreline, and this little dotted line is a low tide shoreline. So everything between is tidal mudflats that are underwater at high tide and exposed at low tide. 
Now, where is this on today's map? Well, here's uh, looking at Charlestown. This is Cambridge. This is the uh, McGrath and O'Brien Highway, I-93, Rutherford Avenue. And that so encompass this bay. So you can see it basically Rutherford Avenue is the eastern boundary. Uh, this road here encompasses most of the bay. That's the uh, O'Brien Highway or McGrath and O'Brien Highway. So what happened? Uh, well, it got filled. Uh, and if you're looking at, if you're interested in land making in Boston, the best place to start is to go to the Leventhal Digital Collections and search for Boston Shoreline, and you'll get back this sequence of shoreline maps that were created for the Mapping Boston book uh, back in the, in the 1990s. So it has a map for various years. The dark green is, is, uh, is land at that time. The lighter color is land is future land, land that is, uh, that is now water and will later be filled. So in 1795, that's what we've been looking at. If I go on to the next one in the sequence, uh, you can see the Prison Point Bay, as it's now labeled in 1852, has gotten much smaller. If I go to the next one, it's pretty much disappeared. There's this thing here called the Miller's River we'll talk about. So let's uh, go on to up to 1818 and take a look at what had happened by in the early years of the 1800s. So here's a map of Charlestown from 1818. And I'm, here's the Charlestown neck here. And if I zoom in on the neck, you can see one of the changes, the Middlesex Canal. The canal opened in 1803. It ran all the way up to uh, what's now Lowell. Uh, and it ended here inside the mill pond. But uh, the canal boats coming down the canal didn't, that's, didn't, didn't for the most part stop there. They continued to Boston Central Waterfront. They would go through the mill pond, through a little sluice gate here, then down the bay, across the river to the Almshouse Wharf on the west, uh, on the west end of Boston. The way that you know there is no towpath like there is alongside the uh, canal or for horses to pull the canal boats. So there was actually a cable strung out this entire length, supported by buoys, and the and the canal boats would pull themselves along. The other. Uh, change is down here at where the point was we saw in the previous map. The point's gotten bigger with land making. And in 1805, the state prison opened. It was designed by Charles Bullfinch. Now, there was a man named Andrew Craigie who was on the original board of directors of the uh, Middlesex Canal. And he foresaw that once the canal boats are going up and down the bay here, this, this land here on that point below the Miller's Creek, as it's now called, uh, would become valuable land. So we bought 300 acres there laid out a street grid, started selling building lots, built a bridge across the river to the west end of Boston that's called Craigie's Bridge or the Canal Bridge, and also started land making along that bridge. Here, this, this piece here is made land. Uh, so now we're gonna zoom forward to an 1855 map. The next form of transportation after the canals was the railroads. So here's our bay and the big change since last time is that you have four different railroads crossing the bay into Boston from the north. Uh, in chronological order, there they were the Boston and Lowell that opened here in 1835. Then the Fitchburg, which went across the bay, touched the Charlestown Peninsula and then continued on here, opened in 1843. The Boston and Maine opened in 1845 and finally the Eastern Railroad in 1854. They're all crossing the bay on low trestle bridges, but, uh, but except here where the Boston Maine has actually built land where, you know, to support, uh, where there was originally just a trestle bridge. And you can see there's much more made land here. The bridge has gotten shorter because the land is, made land has moved out from uh, Leachmere Point towards Boston. The uh, next, now we're gonna jump forward again to 1879 and we'll look at two things. This is a map uh, of Charlestown from 1879. It's a little bit, it's not rotated, so north is up. So it's, you, you have to sort of turn your head a little bit. But uh, here's where the mill pond was. <clears throat> it's the shoreline has moved out and it created Rutherford Avenue. Um, and here's where the Miller's River used to empty out of Charlestown into the bay, but they've, it's been pushed underground 
upstream from the Boston and Lowell Railroad. And you can see a lot more land is being made here along the bridge, the road for the bridge. And those trestle bridges are now wider pieces of land, even with buildings on them. It, uh, this is what it would look, this is what it looked like. This is called a bird's eye view of Boston from the same year. So we're gonna zoom in up here on the, uh, the crossings and the bay behind. So you can see how these crossings have become wide. The Miller's River is here, ducks through a little bit and comes down in two channels to the uh, 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 Boston side. And on the Boston side, there are four railroads, each have their own depots along Causeway Street. Now we'll go ahead to the end of the 1800s, 1899. And as what you'll see is the, uh, the, the land, made, there's more ma made land, it's gotten bigger. Uh, and these bridges have sort of paved over the river in this section here. This was, this was empty land in the previous bird's eye, and now it's all filled with railroad facilities. If we look at a couple of atlases from that time, uh, here is the crossings in North Station just beyond. You can see that the, uh, the Miller's River just goes underneath some of these bridges and connects in two sort of channels to the river. Uh, and then when you get up into, here's the old prison, and then here's the railroad facilities in the, in the former bay, which is split between East Cambridge and Charlestown. Um, and, and so uh, now, now we'll go forward again. This is an aerial photo from 1925, looking north from Boston across the river. So here, is, here are the deep, here are the, the uh, railroad stations which have been unified in 1893 to the North Union Station. Here's all those bridges and crossings we saw before, and you can see some of the rail facilities on the other side, and some land, more land has been made along here. But the other thing I wanted to show you in this picture, let me just get back, is uh, another development in the history of transportation. Uh, the 1890s was the beginning of Boston building its mass transit. Uh, and so in 1901, the main line L opened, and it ran across the river on this new Charlestown Bridge, a steel truss swing bridge. It opened in 1901. Here's a picture. The, the, the bridge had a second deck for the mass transit lines that went above the regular road deck. And upstream from that, here, this is the 1910 Charles River Dam, and this structure next to the old bridge across the river, the Craigie's Bridge or Canal Bridge, is a Leachmere Viaduct. And that carried what's now the Green Line across the river. And these, these lo lovely arches here. Uh, this is a park that used to be on top of the dam. It's now the Museum of Science. This building is still there. And between the building and the park, you can just sort of barely see the, the lock and the continuation of the lock underneath the bridge here. You can see this is not a concrete span like the others. This is steel. This is actually a little drawbridge. I think this, this would open to let ships with tall masts through. Now to get back to the railroads, uh, I'm going to we were looking at 1925. This is 1938. In between, the Boston and Maine Railroad, which had taken control of all the others, built a whole lot of, had a bunch of number of projects that changed this. First of all, they replaced the old Union Station here with the first Boston Garden and the second North Station. It had this uh, uh, 23 platform tracks behind it that switched down to four Scherzer rolling lift bridges. So now, now we no longer have bridges spread over a wide range. They're all concentrated right there. Each bridge carries two tracks. So there's eight tracks, tracks across. Over here, this is made land. that was done as part of that project. And also uh, what's happened here is that much of the Miller's River has been buried. So it's actually, we've got this piece here. We've got this piece that connects to the river. And in between, they put, put, uh, push the stream into a culvert underneath all of these tracks. And a little bit farther up, there is uh, I can find it. this massive roundhouse had slots for 54 locomotives. By um, 19, by 19, this is a 1969 aerial, the same area. And by, by this time, the railroads had declined quite a bit. Uh, so the lot, much of the railroad facilities have been removed. So if you look here at North Station, there's only half as many tracks as before. Half the tracks were torn up and turned into a parking lot. 
and the two bridges that service so that half of the tracks have been removed. There's only two left. This area has been turned into uh, an industrial park. Uh, and um, there's, so, so most, basically most of those railroad facilities are gone. Why did the railroads decline? Well, that's because of the rise of the highways. Uh, the, you know, the United States invested heavily in highways and not anymore in railroads. The uh, first highway through Boston was the old elevated Fitzgerald Expressway. It crossed the river on a new highway bridge. This is a Charlestown High Bridge, a double deck bridge. This is the Boston side, comes over to Charlestown and incurs onto US 1 North. You don't see the I-93 double deck viaduct in this picture because that wasn't uh, completed until 1972. And then fast forward to the end of the century, here's that same Charlestown High Bridge. Uh, here's the I-93 connection, double deck, and next to it is the Zakem Bridge under construction. So let's just take a look finally at what this area looks like today. So this is where the bay was, replaced by the rail yard. And as you can see now, it's re been replaced by many other things. Uh, you have uh, Bunker Hill Community College up here, um, North Point Park down here, North Point Development stretching along the uh, Bridge Street, uh, Craigie's Bridge Street up here past the Leachmere Station. Uh, but, so you don't see much of the bay at all. Uh, what you can see though is that this, this, this is still a transportation corridor. So you've got uh, the Leachmere Viaduct still in use by the Green Line. You've got the highway, I-93, the Zakem Bridge and Leverett Connector. You've got the commuter rail crossing the river on the two remaining Scherzer rolling lift bridges. And downstream, this photo is out of date. This is the old Charlestown Bridge that we saw pictures, old pictures of. Uh, that bridge was demolished last year and they're currently building the new, the third Charlestown Bridge. If you wanna see something though, uh, what I recommend is go to North Point Park here you got a great view of the uh, Leachmere Viaduct looking upstream. And you can walk over here to this North Bank pedestrian bridge, which connects North Point Park in, in Cambridge with the Paul Revere Park over here in, Cam in uh, Charlestown, excuse me. The bridge takes you over the rail corridor and you can look towards Boston and see the two Scherzer rolling lift bridges. These light colored rectangular boxes are actually the uh, the 220-ton uh, counterweights. And this structure here is Signal Tower A. It was a, it's the lone remainder of that vast Boston to Maine rail yard. If you go a little bit farther, when you're just as you're, come, as you're going underneath the lever connector on the bridge, you will also go over what remains of the Miller's River. It is, in fact, still there. If I switch to map view, you can see here it is. It goes a short ways up and then dips into a culvert heading, uh, heading upstream. So that's the quick version of the Prison Point Bay. Do we, uh, the next part is going to be talking about where resources you can, you can uh, use, but I just wanted to make sure there's no questions before that. Rachel, is there anything? Um, we just had a question. We had a question from Belle about um, who Leachmere was um, based yeah. on my Oh, uh, Leachmere was a loyalist who owned that property in revolutionary times. Uh, he uh, went to England at the, you know, in 1776. He left the, left Massachusetts never to return. Um, I don't know how the property was transferred eventually to Craigie. Some properties were sold and the original Tory owners were paid. And in other cases, the property was confiscated by the Commonwealth. And so, cool. Thank you. Okay, shall we go on to the the next part here? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Um, so, you know, if you want to tell some particular story using historical maps and atlases and images, um, you know, obviously your first stop should be the Leventhal Center's uh, website. Uh, which contains literally thousands of maps of Boston. Uh, so the question is, where do you get started? Uh, this is sort of a top 10 list of old maps of Boston uh, based on uh, feedback from Nancy Seashoals and a former curator at the Leventhal uh, 
Peter Grimm. We've seen some of these. We've seen the shoreline reconstructed. We've seen the page 1775. Uh, we've seen some atlases when we looked at the atlas view of uh, Charlestown and Boston, and we've seen some of the aerials. Uh, there's a couple other worth pointing out. Uh, Hale's 1814 is an excellent detailed map of Boston showing individual uh, building footprints. Uh, the next one that's really good is the Annan and Smith 1826. Again, fairly detailed. It, it does include a little bit of the Prison Point Bay. You can see up here the streets that Craigie had laid out uh, in Leachmere Point. Uh, in 1852, there were two excellent sheet maps, large scale, very detailed sheet maps of Boston. This one by McIntyre, which also has illustrations of prominent buildings and also uh, one by Slatter and Callan, which also very detailed down to individual building footprints. Now, uh, so the question is, uh, where can you go to get maps online? Um, there's uh, two places. Uh, uh, at the 11th all, it's digital collection and it's Atlas scope. And Rachel is going to, now I'm going to hand it over to Rachel so that she can give you a, a little too, too quick tutorial on those two. Sure. Um, so do you want to click on the digital collection uh, oh, link? Should I do a stop sharing so you can, you can go ahead? Or or? Should I? Pardon me? Um, yeah, let me let me share. Okay. Stay tuned. There we go. Um, so there are a couple of ways that you can interact with our collections. Um, I recommend heading to collections.leventhalmap.org. Uh, um, so you can kind of explore um, there. You can, um, sorry, my internet's really slow. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can sort by a lot of different uh, filters here. So I recommend um, especially filtering by year down here. Um, you can kind of change the parameters. Um, again, we have like thousands of digitized maps here. You can see like even in this short like 50 year period that I've selected, we have over 600 maps of Boston, um, which is pretty extravagant, I would say. Um, you can always click through uh, to see any of these maps in really high definition. Um, and you can download the maps as well. So um, bear with me. So you can um, check these out. I recommend if you want to um, download them, we have, oh, this one doesn't have a TIFF, but usually we have um, really high resolution uh, TIFF images. We have uh, JPEGs at full resolution and smaller. Some of our maps are also, um, are also geo-referenced. And the ones that aren't, you actually can georeference yourself. So um, georeferencing is like uh, basically laying the map over a, a modern app of Boston, um, the way that we've done with Atlas Scope, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but basically, you can um, download these yourself. You can uh, play with them online. Um, I really recommend zooming all the way in because these are such high quality images, which my internet probably is not um, going to show you, but um, they're really beautiful. I really like this one, especially. 
Um, and they've got uh, really a lot of detail. So um, that's one of the resources that I recommend checking out. Um, another one is Atlas Scope, um, which is our um, kind of digital portal to explore Boston history through different uh, urban atlas layers. There's a bunch of options. So you can um, click find me on the left, search places in the middle, or start a BPL, which drops you at um, Copley uh, at the Central Library. So we can do that. Basically, what this is, is um, layers of urban atlases, which are these huge books um, that uh, work the same way that you would expect a modern atlas to work with an index in the front and then um, pages of uh, the different sections of the map um, of the city. But what we've done is basically digitally uh, stick them all together, sew them up along the edges um, so that it's just one big map at very high resolution. Um, and it's overlaid on a map of the city from today. So you can um, compare how things have changed over the years. You can, here, um, you can compare things, um, compare different years to each other or compare it to a modern map. It always drops you on the, um, the oldest layer which is something to be aware of, but you can um, drop it up, drop up the uh, list here and choose any year you want. Um, if I zoom in here on the BPL, um, we've got the Boston Public Library we have Boston University own the building um, where the Johnson building is today. You can even see the fountain here that they have marked off. Um, and so these are like really detailed maps. They tell you everything from the building material. They tell you, um, so like pink is brick, yellow is wood, um, usually, or frame. Um, these are usually uh, insurance maps, fire insurance maps. So what they're telling you is all about how much it is to insure a building, which tells you uh, not, not everything you would want to know today, but definitely a lot about uh, building materials, who owns a place. Um, some of these maps have really, really detailed information like uh, where the windows are in the buildings, um, whether there's a furnace, whether there's a night watchman at a certain building. Um, and so they're just like very detailed resources that you can use to explore how Boston has changed over the centuries. Um, and I think they're also just really beautiful. So uh, definitely check out Atlas Scope. Um, I will drop the link in the chat. Um, and there's and a link in I there recommend... Oh, sorry, keep going, Dennis. Uh, then it's there's links in the PDF handout to uh, all these things. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you you can also um, one thing that's kind of fun. Um, if I go back to the original, the basic uh, splash page, um, find me is really fun. If you're walking around Boston, um, you can actually click this uh, first button, and it will like track your GPS location and you can explore um, Boston over the years um, based on where you are. You can also search places. Um, one caveat is that you can only search modern addresses. So it is a little complicated for doing historical research because addresses have changed over the years. Um, but you can always search the modern address and then like kind of extrapolate from there. Like sometimes you'll search a certain address and then find out that like the, no, the street number has changed 
but you can like pan a few doors down and you'll find the building that you're actually looking for. Uh, so yeah, um, Dennis, were there other resources that you wanted to talk yeah, about? Yeah, could I just uh, share a screen again for real quick to finish that up? Yeah, sure. Okie doke. Screen application window. All righty, are we, is my uh, screen up there, Rachel? Uh, there no. Go. Okay, all righty. Uh, so if you um, don't find the atlas you need in the atlas scope, your next stop should be the state's real estate atlas digitization project. They've got many, many atlases. Some are at the um, state level somewhere at the county level, and then individual towns. And if you click on um, the Flickr link, it will take you, it will bring you to images of the pages in the Atlas. Uh, these are just images, they aren't geo-referenced the way Atlas Scope is, but you know, if you need something that we can't find on Atlas Scope, here's a place to go. The, another place to go is the Boston Atlas. It's on the Boston Planning and Development Agency's website. The BPDA is the successor to the BRA, and they have a bunch of maps of uh, various kinds. The technology behind it, if you actually click on things, is something called Map Junction, which is uh, sort of similar to Atlas Scope, but it has uh, 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 more of a range in terms of time and space. Uh, also, they have sheet maps and um, aerials that you don't see on Atlas Scope. But you want to start with the two first the two at the top that Rachel showed us. And, and uh, if you can't find something there, then there's other places to look. Uh, that's the end of our sort of presentation part of this session. And, and now we're into the more interactive part where we'd love to hear what your project is uh, or answer your questions about where to get, you know, where to find resources. Yeah, um, we have a couple questions. We have um, Megan asked, um, is this available for Massachusetts in general or just Boston? So at the moment, Atlas Scope is only um, covering the like uh, Boston and the inner suburbs. Um, so like uh, we have Newton, um, we have some maps of Cambridge and Somerville. Um, I think like Winthrop, uh, Everett, um, not a whole lot of those suburbs, um, but a little bit, um, like a couple layers for each one. That's that's Atlas Scope, but of course the digital collection has sheet maps for yeah, uh, the exactly. wider area. Exactly. So um, we have sheet maps for for much uh, much more of the state, um, and we are also like there are urban atlases that exist for other places in Massachusetts. So the hope is that someday those can be incorporated into Atlas Scope. Um, that is something that we are uh, working on, uh, but not quite there yet. Um, so hopefully that will be available in the future. Um, yeah. And then we have a question from uh, Laurel. Uh, is there a specific set of maps for the old West End and current courthouse area? Um, there are, so the West End, there are some like good, urban atlas, um, like you can see what the West End used to look like on the urban atlases for sure. Um, yeah, so I would recommend checking those out. Uh, there isn't like, I don't know, if you search West End in our collections, I think that you will probably come up with um, mostly just maps of downtown Boston. Um, but I do recommend trying that out. I've never, um, I don't know if there are maps like specifically of the West End, but there are definitely um, like urban atlases that include that area. Yeah, and also these sheet maps uh, on this slide here will also include the West End. Uh, and if you're interested in the West End at the time of its urban renewal, um, USGS aerials uh, from the 50s and 60s will give you a, a good sort of before and after. Mm-hmm. 
Cool. Um, we'd, be, we'd be interested in hearing if uh, from you guys about any particular thing you're trying to do, uh, like the West End. Yeah, um, if anybody has like research that they are trying to do, um, not only are we happy to talk about it right now, but we also have um, a bunch of different resources for you, one of which is our um, like GIS office hours. Um, our GIS librarian, Belle, um, does those on Fridays at 11 a.m. Um, they're drop-ins, so if you have like questions about any any kind of like mapping digitally, um, even if you are starting from scratch, um, she is happy to help you. Um, we also have a reference librarian who can talk to you about uh, like general map uh, questions, including all of our historic maps. She's uh, very well versed in our collection. Um, probably knows more about it than definitely knows more about it than anybody else who works here. Um, so we do have a lot of resources um, at your disposal. You can always email us or um, email. You can email me. I'll drop my email in the chat. Um, but yeah, you can email info at leventhalmap.org as well. Um, we have a question from Ken. There's a sign on Com Ave. It's only the size of a postcard built into the curb. It indicates uh, one mile from maybe from the Boston Stone. I don't know anything about that. Um, it's probably one mile from the State House. So the State House opened in 1798, and since then, I believe distances are usually measured from the dome of the State House. Commonwealth Avenue did not exist before 1798. It was created in the 1880s. So I'm guessing it be, would be from the State House. But if you, I, I don't know where that thing is, but if you, can, if you know where it is, you could go on to Google Maps and say, you know, give me directions to walk from this point to the State House, and it'll tell you how many miles that is. <laughs> and if it's one mile, that's that's your then answer. You're, then you're done. If it's yeah, <laughs> if it's less than a mile, then then try for the uh, for Salt Lane there, where the where the stone is. Cool. Yeah, that's a really good question. I've never seen that before. Um, which is funny. I lived on Con Ave for a while. Um, what is the Boston Stone, Dennis? It's a bowling ball sized stone. It's sort of stuck into the side of one of those very old buildings uh, on the uh, near, uh, that's between, between on Hanover Street, a south side between Blackstone Street and, and Union Street. So where they like the Bell and Hand pub are. There's a thing yeah, called the Boston Stone. It's a, it was a, a it's a, uh, it's paint. It's a paintball. It's it's sixteen hundreds paintballs. Uh, it's, it was a big round stone that they would use to crush pigment and before mixing it into the oil to make paint. So they would have they had a trough the same size and they would roll this over the pigment. Pigment would be imported from Europe. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, Ken says that uh, they'll take a picture of it. Okay. Yeah, send it to us. Um, uh, here, I'll drop evanfallnap.org. Um, everyone is welcome to email us um, or email me. My email is on the website. Um, but if you info if you email info at leventhalmap.org, then they can direct you to <laughs> the proper person because it might not be me. Um, as you might be able to tell, I'm not necessarily a Boston history expert. Um, although I am learning more all the time. Uh, most of my Boston history is like 18th century, so. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, the only uh, questions that we had ahead of time were about uh, Jamaica Plain history, which you can actually check out um, our most recent video um, before today's video, which is on um, both YouTube and Facebook for a bunch of Jamaica Plain history. Um, we The other question was about the history of infill in Boston, um, which I think Dennis did a really good job covering 
Um, oh, if uh, if you're if someone is interested in the history of land making in Boston, there's a big intimidating book called Gaining Ground by Nancy Seashoals, and that is, you know, the definitive source on this. It's a really great book, um, and very beautiful, and it has a lot of our maps in it. So <laughs> it's a, a win on every level. Um, if anybody has any more questions, let us know. I'm also going to um, drop a feedback form link. So if you have time, um, please fill out this form. Um, let us know if you have any feedback about this event or about if you would want to learn more about anything in, in particular. Um, we are happy to like, uh, kind of cater our programming to what people are actually interested in. So um, it seems like uh, a lot of people are interested in, in Boston by Math and we're really excited about that. We will be doing this event again and um, I'll be sending out over our social media um, a couple of uh, options for what we can cover next time that Dennis has come up with. Um, so it's definitely supposed to be interactive on every level, including getting to decide what we talk about. Um, and, uh, and another way they can, you know, build on what they saw today is just download the PDF. All of these links will take you to the maps that you saw today, as well as the, uh, the, pre, the, pre, uh, the maps specifically of uh, Port, Prison Point Bay. Yeah, yeah. If, if you guys scroll all the way up to uh, the beginning of this stream, uh, I linked to the, the slides for this presentation. So um, Dennis has thoughtfully linked all of the maps um, that he used in this presentation, which you can check out um, on your own time. Great. Well, if nobody has any more questions, um, we can um, head out, but please fill out that feedback form, especially if you are um, trying to do your own research, um, we are happy to um, to talk about your specific uh, research next time. We would love to have it be like kind of an interactive um, presentation where we um, do a deep dive into your own stuff. Um, and that's pretty much all I have. Anything else, Dennis? Uh, no, thank you to everybody for your attention. I hope you found this useful and you'll join us again. Yeah. Uh, could I talk to you after we go uh, go into the backstage <laughs> mode? For sure. Okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you, everybody. Um, it's been a blast. And I hope you guys had fun. Um, fill out the feedback form. And we will see you again in a month or so. Stay tuned to our social media to see um, when we'll be doing this again.